Every so often on social media, an argument that I've dubbed the work with wars starts up between pagans, especially those of the reconstructionist or revivalist bent. Many people have an aversion to the term worship, either brought on by theological arguments they've decided on or religious trauma lingering from conversion. But the truth is, the ancients had many different terms for the various actions they took in furthering or preserving Cadiz with their gods. So if we're going to get pedantic, let's do so in a positive way. Let's go over some of these terms, their potential English counterparts, and then circle back to the work with wars to see how the community may benefit to a differing approach to them. Karate. Precision of language was fairly important in ancient Greece, and remains so in communication today. Umberto Eco once claimed that there are no true synonyms, only words that outwardly look like synonyms at a first glance. In reality, this is true. Our brains instinctively search for the correct word among those with seemingly similar definitions, and not using a more appropriate word is more a matter of exposure and vocabulary. For an example, consider the difference between forgive me father for I have sinned and sorry daddy I've done naughty things. That isn't to say we should get pedantic regarding definitions for more nebulous phrases per se, but more that the community may benefit from a more thorough understanding of the ancient counterparts to modern terms around our interactions with the gods, as it can both help improve our modern communication and revivalist movements and potentially deepen our understanding of the mindsets that we may be trying to reconstruct. My primary focus throughout this video is going to be on the ancient terms that we can relate to many common phrases and words that we use to represent our actions as they relate to the gods, including numerous examples from primary text to illustrate my points. That means that this is going to be a quote and example heavy video, and I'm going to be reading out a lot of them to make sure that folks who are podcasting the episode don't miss them. Though, as I said before, I think that looking deeper at these terms and examining the examples can give us a good idea of how the ancients saw the gods and help us as modern pagans look more deeply at what terms we personally use and why. This video will be divided into four parts. The first covers a number of ancient Greek terms related to worship and performing sacrifices, mystery rites, and other acts related to said worship. The second will deal with acts surrounding soothing the anger of the gods, as well as related acts of purification and casting out of troublesome spirits, as well as attempting to get the gods on your side if you need their help. Part three will cover some additional ideas like divine service and other terms that are a little more off the beaten path. Finally, we'll return to the arguments for and against the term work with and discuss whether or not it's historical, why people use it, and what the theological understanding may amount to as as compared to ancient attitudes. As per usual, this isn't meant to be prescriptive so much as to start a discussion in the community about the way we talk about things, much like my previous video on Epiphania. My hope is that we can learn to communicate better within our communities about these essential ideas, because proper communication allows for us to integrate these concepts more easily into our practices and our lives. Let's get into it. Part 1. Worship, Honor, and Veneration the ancient Greeks used a number of terms that could be considered as synonymous to worship, though, like all synonyms, there were subtle differences in usage between them, both over time and on an individual level. We'll be taking a look at three sets of terms related specifically to honor and worship for the gods, Time, Sebasmos, and Semnotes. We'll look at ancient examples of contexts where they were used and their cognates, or words that split off from the same base word as these terms to get an idea of how these acts were viewed in ancient times. The first of these terms related to worship and sacrifice we're going to take a look at is Time, defined as honors bestowed upon by an outside authority or that which is due to the gods as gods. I've talked extensively on this channel in the past about the concept of charis or gift exchange and reciprocity. One could easily say that the entirety of ancient Greek society was held together by these cycles of gratitude, giving, and returned gifts. Honor itself was tied up in recognition. One primary purpose of thusia, or burned sacrifice, was to confirm honor on the gods. Likewise with the performance of hymnoi, many of which reference conferring honor to the gods. This was a term most often used in the following contexts as a thanks for a blessing or service rendered, a recognition of the power and esteem of the person, or just a recognition of that person's place and the role that they fulfill. One of the oldest examples we have of time being used in reference to esteem or honor being conferred from an authority 
authority to those they rule comes from Hesiod's Theogony. Just before the Titanomachy, Zeus promises, For so did Styx, the deathless daughter of Ocean, plan on that day when the Olympian lightning god called all of the deathless gods to Great Olympus and said that whosoever of the gods would fight with him against the Titans, he would not cast him out from his rights, but each should have the office, Timai, which he had before amongst the deathless gods. After both the Titans and Tufos have been dealt with, Zeus distributes the offices of the gods to those who assisted him and sided with him, both the children of the Titans and the Titans that saw fit to fight alongside them. These honors and offices, often called domains and aspects by modern pagans, are the primary things that both the majority of ancient and modern pagans worshipped and honored the gods for, hoping for potential future intervention for them and their families. Time could also refer to honors and gifts for both gods and humans. If someone in ancient Greece felt that they had been denied their due honors, they might ask the gods to intervene, as Thetis did in the Iliad when she appealed to Zeus for honor for her son and punishment for the Achaeans. But honor him, Olympian Zeus, lord of counsel, and give might to the Trojans and tell the Achaeans do honor unto my son and magnify him with recompense. On the human side of things, poets were often said to be honored, especially for their services, conferred in part due to the blessings of the Musai and their privileged relationship with them. See my video on the muses and bards for more on why that might be. Herald, take and give this portion to Demodocus that he may eat, and I will greet him despite my grief, for among all men that are upon the earth minstrels win honor and reverence, for that the muse has taught them the paths of song and loves the tribe of minstrels. Musical performance and composition and dance were all essential parts of collective Greek cultus. See my second god profile on the muses if you'd like to know more about why that is. Regardless, it's clear that for services rendered and special inspiration and access, reciprocal exchange is essential. This also extends to the cults outside of the Aaronic deities. Offerings to underworld deities needed to be made alongside Coes for the dead in order to acknowledge the office of said underworld deities so that the soul of the deceased could be briefly released. The offerings themselves were also called honors. We see this in Aeschylus' The Persians. But come, my friends, chant solemn songs as I make these libations to the dead, and summon forth the divine spirit of Darius, while I convey, in honor of the gods, these offerings for the earth to drink. In fact, a level of humility, not in the Christian sense, but more in a healthy recognition of the reality of things, as much as a person can within their limited worldview, was considered a part of offering. In Sophocles' Aias, we see the titular character realize that he must understand where things sit in the world in order to move forward in it. And so, hereafter, I shall first know how to yield to the gods, and second, learn to revere the Atridae. They are the rulers, so we must submit. How could it be otherwise? Things of awe and might submit to authority, to me. So it is that winter with its snow-covered paths gives way to fruitful summer. Night's dark orbit makes room for day with her white horses to kindle her radiance. The blast of dreadful winds allows the groaning sea to rest, and among them all, almighty sleep releases the fettered sleeper and does not hold him in perpetual grasp. And we men then must we not learn self-restraint? I at least will learn it, since I am newly aware that an enemy is to be hated only as far as suits one who will in turn become a friend. Similarly to a friend, I would wish to give only so much help and service as suits him who will not forever remain friendly. For the masses regard the haven of comradeship as treacherous. But concerning things, it will be well. You wife, go inside and pray to the gods, telestai timate, that the desires of my heart may be completed to the very end. We actually see Time use twice the there. The first is in the recognition of the physical nature of order, that even deities and natural forces must yield to one another in order to move. The second is when he requests that his wife go pray to the gods and recognize their offices that he might benefit from the prayer. This was somewhat normal in ancient Greece, as prayers made in the household, typically by the male head of household or someone they designated, in this case his wife, were seen as benefiting the entire house. Of course, the recognition of due honors means recognizing when the gods have already helped as well, such as when Astyagas became terrified of his son and told Arbeg Harpagos, his cowherd, to see that he would be done away with. Harpagos refused and hid him away in the forest, and later Astyagas ends up killing Harpagos' son and feeding him to him in a feast as punishment. But at this point in the story, no one knows that yet. Yeah, apparently ancient histories get dark. This is at least somewhat sarcastic, but keep in mind, it's actually supposed to be trickery and reflects what the attitude should have been in the minds of the ancient historian. For Hastiagas said, I was greatly afflicted by what had been once done to this boy, and it weighed heavily on me that I was estranged from my daughter. Now then, in this turn of good fortune, send your own son to this boy newly come, and since I am about to sacrifice for the boy's safety to the gods whom this honor is due, come here and dine with me. Time wasn't the only word 
word used for rites of worship and offering, however. There were also words related to offerings that referred to feelings that were drummed up by the act, such as sebos and its cognates, which roughly translates to the feeling of reverence or reverent awe at the sight of a god. Sabots and its derivatives often showed up when referring to feelings surrounding epiphanies, such as the terror of Metanera when encountering Demeter in her human form in the Homeric hymn. Then awe and reverence, Sebomai, and pale fear took hold of Metanera, and she rose from her couch to ford Demeter and bade her to be seated. This sort of amazement could also be found in mortal displays of grand wealth and statues, such as that could only be otherwise found among the gods, such as Telemachus' overwhelm at the sight of Menelaus. Of such sort, methinks, is the court of Olympian Zeus, within and such untold wealth is here, amazement took hold of me as I look. From Sebas we get Sebesomai, to feel awe or fear before the gods, to worship in awe. This refers to a number of different gods and practices, but is frequently found in hymns and relating to the performance of hymns and choral dances. In Pindar's Olympian Ode 14, he says of the Karites and Apollon, not even the gods arrange dances or feasts without the holy graces who oversee everything that is done in heaven. With their thrones set beside Pythian Apollon of the golden bow, they worship Sebesomai, the everlasting honor of the Olympian father. Sebesomai was also also used as an instruction for the proper attitude of the worshippers in Aeschylus' suppliant women should take during a ritual to several foreign gods and Hermes. Honor to the mutual altar of all of these protecting powers, and seat yourself on the holy ground like a flock of doves and dread hawks of the same feathered tribe, kindred yet foes who would defile their race. The word also makes an appearance as a verb when the women shout back in response to a bard in a ritual performed in Aristophanes, Desmophoria Zeuse. I do honor to the divine Leto and to the Lear, the mother of songs of male and noble strains, the eyes of the goddess sparkle while listening to our enthusiastic chants. Hail to the powerful Foivos! Hail, blessed son of Leto! And in Aeschylus' Agamemnon, Hermes is referred to as the most revered herald by the herald in line 515 as he offers to Zeus the heroes and his patron Hermes. I'm sure you can see a theme emerging from these terms, worship as recognition and awe before the gods as much as the willingness to offer. This continues with the next term we're going to cover, Semnos, which is the attribute of the gods which produces the effect of Sabos in humans, awe-inspiring or overwhelming. It can also mean holy or dedicated to a god, as we see in Euripides' Ion when describing a priest's life. When young, he played round the shrine and was nourished there, but when he grew to manhood, the Delphians made him guardian of the god's treasures, a trusted steward of all, and here in the temple of the god he has lived a holy, Semnon, life. However, as I dug deeper into use cases for Semnos as a descriptor for actions performed for the gods, I found it was most often used in connection with underworld deities and mystery rites, such as those of Demeter at Eleusis or the Dionysian mystery rites. We see this at the end of the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which describes how the mysteries of Eleusis were gifted to humans and why. Then she went and to the kings who deal justice, Triptolemos and Diocles, the horse driver, and to the mighty Eumolpos and Keleos, leader of the people, she showed how to conduct her rites and she taught them all of her mysteries, to Triptolemos and Polixenius, and Diocles also, awful Semna, mysteries, which no one may in any way transgress or pry into, or utter, for deep awe, Sebas, of the gods checks the voice. The same sort of phrasing is echoed in Euripides' Bacche, when the perpetually impious Pentheus challenges Dionysos, who is disguised as his own priest, on when the mystery writes to the new god, Dionysos, that he is introducing are performed. Pentheus, do you perform the rites by night or by day, Dionysos, mostly by night, darkness conveys awe, Semnoteta. Just as Basamai, we see a connection between awe and fear. That said, cognates of Semnos could also be used to describe rites performed privately to the gods, such as when Heracles is described as performing private solemn rites to his father and the gods before his death in Sophocles' Trechinie. At first, a wretched man, he prayed in a calm mind, Semnon Orgon, rejoicing in his lovely garment. As an aside, the Furies or Erinyes were referred to as the Semnai Theai, or kindly or holy goddesses, in Athens generally. They would have rites of propitiation performed to them regularly to help avoid their wrath on the city-state. Part 2. Propitiation, Expiation, Purification Propitiation differs from worship in the Greek mind by degrees. Frequently, deities would be propitiated following a divine epiphany, see my video on the topic for more on epiphanies, or if someone thought that they might have done something to provoke agos. But offerings to gain the favor of the gods in a contest or for another purpose were often referred to using terms that would have also translated to the Latin propitios, the majority of which derive from the term hilaos, which means kindly or appeased. One of the earliest examples we get of hilaos referring to offerings and the gods is in the 
Odyssey, when Nestor, following an epiphany with Athena, urges the group to propitiate her that she might look kindly on their purpose. And they led godlike Telemachus and made him sit beside them, and the horseman, Nestor of Grenia, was the first to speak among them. Quickly, my dear children, fulfill my desire that the first of the gods I may propitiate Athena, who came to me in manifest presence to the rich feast of the god. Come now, let one go to the plain for a heifer, that she may come speedily, and that the neat herd may drive her. And let one go to the black ship of great-hearted Telemachus, and bring all of his comrades, and let him leave two men only. And let one again bid the goldsmith Lerkes come hither, that he may overlay the heifer's horns with gold. Interestingly, Nestor doesn't assume that Athena must be kindly if she had already manifested to him. Rather, he saw her appearance as significant, and immediately interpreted it as an omen requiring him to propitiate her. This makes sense, as I covered in my video on epiphanies, the gods are scary when they appear to humans. Awe is very closely related to fear in the ancient Greek mind, and feeling both at the same time in the presence of a disguised deity is one of the ways a pious person can pick out an epiphany. In Nestor's case, Athena flew away so fast that she allowed him to identify her. His response was to immediately offer to ensure that she would be kindly to their cause and not work against them. This is similar to the proactive propitiation displayed in the Olympian Ode 7 from Pindar, in which he asks for the favor of the gods for the victors at the Olympic Games and in the Pythian. As when someone takes a goblet, all golden, the most prized of his possessions, foaming with the dew of the vine from a generous hand, and makes a gift to his young son-in-law, welcoming a toast from one home to another, honoring the grace of the symposium and the new marriage bond, and thereby, in the presence of his friends, makes him enviable for his harmonious marriage bed. I, too, sending to victorious men poured nectar, the gift of the muses, the sweet fruit of my mind. I try to win the goddess's favor for those men who were victors at Olympia and at the pitho. Notice again that just because the victors won contest dedicated to the gods, there isn't an assumption that they're favored by them. We saw this too in Solon's prayer to the muses, in which I covered in the first part of my muse god profile, where Solon says that it's easy for men in their short-sightedness to assume they have the favor of the gods in their success, when in fact the things that they're doing are ill-advised and the scales of justice will at some point tip back against them. When referring to the dead in hero cult, there's frequently an assumption that because heroes die far from their lands and often in tragic ways, they're particularly powerful, but also rather cranky as dead folks. Offering to them are often referred to as propitiation, such as in Herodotus. Philippus of Croton, son of Butakides, was among those who followed Dorias and was slain with him. He had been betrothed to the daughter of Telus of Sibaris, but was banished from Croton. Cheated out of his marriage, he sailed away to Crene, from where he set forth and followed Dorios, bringing his own trireme and covering expenses for all of his men. This Philippus was a victor at Olympia and in the fairest Greek of his day. For his physical beauty, he received from the Egestrians honors accorded to no one else. They built a hero shrine by his grave and offer him sacrifices of propitiation. In later antiquity, we see this crop up in the terms Hilaskomai and Hilasmos, which refers specifically to rites of propitiation to win the favor of or ease the anger of the gods, such as when Medea instructs Jason on the propitiation of Hecate as a suppliant in the Argonautica. Take heed now, and I may devise help for thee. When at thy coming, father has already given the deadly teeth from the dragon's jaws for sowing, then watch for the time as the night is parted in twain, then bathe in the stream of the tireless river, and alone, apart from others, clad in dusky raiment, dig rounded pit, and there slay an ewe. Sacrifice it whole, heaping it high on the pyre at the very edge of the pit. And propitiate only begotten Hecate, daughter of Perseus, pouring from a goblet the hive-stored labor of bees. And then, when thou hast heedfully sought the grace of the goddess, retreat from the pyre, and let neither the sound of feet driving thee to turn back, nor of the baying of hounds, lest haply thou should maim all of the rites, and thyself fail to return duly to thy comrades. As we can see, favor toward any individual or group of humans wasn't assumed to be a given in ancient times, so it was always good to try and win the favor of the gods when you need their help for something important to you. Where Tame can be used for any offering performed either individually on or on a polis level, I've noticed that the cognates for Semnos and Sebas were mostly used in reference to collective polis rites, and Helaus referred primarily to individual offerings and prayers. Of course, when anyone performs these rites, it's important to purify from miasma and other pollutants, which is where terms like hognos come in, which means pure from pollution or holy and dedicated to the gods. From this, we get the term hagnismata, used in Aeschylus Eumenides when referring to the purification of Orestes via the wrath of the gods. O oh, mother night, hear me, mother who gave birth to me as retribution for the blind and seeing, for Leto's son dishonors me by snatching away this cowering wretch, a proper expiation from his mother's blood. 
We also get hognizo, or to wash off or cleanse by water. We see Aias refer to this in Sophocles' play by the same name. But I will go to the bathing place and the meadows by the shore, so that by purging my defilements I may escape the heavy anger of the goddess. Then I will find some isolated spot and bury the sword of mine, most hateful weapon, digging down into the earth where none can see. Let night and Hades keep it underground. For ever since I first took into my hand this gift from Hector, my greatest enemy, I have gotten no good from the Greeks. Yes, men's proverb is true, the gifts of enemies are no gifts and bring no good. This term is also used in Euripides' Iphigenia and Taurus, where the titular character is talking to Orestes, who has killed his mother, and is referring to needing to wash things he has touched in the sea in order to cleanse them. Orestes, make use of my troubles if you gain by it. Iphigenia. And that it is not right to sacrifice you to the goddess. Orestes, with what reason? I have a suspicion. Iphigenia, because you are not pure, I will frighten what is sacred. Orestes, how does this help us to see the statue of the goddess? Iphigenia, I shall want to purify you in the waves of the sea. This sort of purification is different from that which is referred to by apotropaic rites, which are closer to averting unpleasant things. Apotropos and its cognates are often used when referring to talking angry people out of doing unpleasant things, as well as when referring to dealing with deadly or cranky spirits, or averting the anger of deities. In Aeschylus's The Persians, Atosa, after having a horrifying dream, talks about making offerings to the gods which of her evil using this term. Such was the vision I beheld in the night, but when I had arisen, dipped my hands in the clear flowing water of a spring, I drew near to the altar with incense in my hand, intending to make an offering of a sacrificial cake to the divinities that avert evil, those to whom these rites are due. And in Euripides' Phonese, Yocasta counsels her son against praising tyranny and ambition, to which the chorus replies, calling out for the gods to avert evil from the place due to his terrible words. Someone will be sure to say, Adrastos, you made an evil betrayal, we are ruined by the marriage of one bride. You are eager for two evils, my son, the loss of those there and ruin in the midst of your efforts here. Lay aside your violence, my sons, lay it aside. Two men's follies, once they meet, result in a very deadly evil. Chorus leader, O gods, avert these troubles and reconcile the sons of Oedipus. So as we can see, apatropiasmos and apatropos are taking something from a state of evil or moral misconduct to a neutral state again, banishing things that would be considered morally repugnant to the gods. Hagnismata and lumata, which is derived from the word for washing water or the dregs for filtered from water used to wash, on the other hand, are almost more of a physical purification, though on occasion they can also refer to the cleansing of Agos through divine wrath. Either way, purification and expiation are actually actually different things. But what of divine service and dedication? And what the heck is theurgy? Part 3. Divine service and other interesting terms. In the classical era, and later a newer term, which was a cognate of the word for slave or servant, emerged to describe activities related to worshipping a god, particularly from a priestly point of view. Therapeia means service to a god or devotion to a god, though it can also mean services rendered in other contexts, such as a doctor providing a service to a patient or nurturing and caring for children. We see this in Euripides' Electra, when the chorus tells a story and talks about its utility while chastising Electra herself. It is said, but I have small belief in it, that the sun turned round its glowing throne of gold, changing it to the misfortune of mankind for the punishment of mortals, but tales that frighten men are of profitable service to the gods, of whom you had no thought when you killed your husband, you who are the relative of famous brothers. Another of Euripides' plays, Eon, talks about service to the god Apollon in the city in reference to places of worship. Not only in our holy Athens are there the halls of the gods, with beautiful columns, and worship, Therapea, of Apollon, who guards these streets, but also in the house of Loxias, Leto's son, there is a light of two countenances with lovely eyes. Isocrates refers to divine service when praising the Egyptians in his 11th letter to Poseidus. The piety of the Egyptians and their worship, Therapea, of the gods are especially deserving of praise and admiration. For all persons who have so bedizened themselves as to create a impression that they possess greater wisdom or some other excellence than they can rightly claim certainly do harm to their dupes. But those persons who have so championed the cause of religion that divine rewards and punishments are made to appear more certain than they prove to be, such men, I say, benefit the greatest measure in the lives of men. Platon, of course, used the term therapeia liberally throughout his works to refer to service of the gods and service to the state by the various classes, with a special emphasis put on the term and its definition in the Euthyphron dialogue, when the titular pompous man claims that piety is therapeia, or service to the gods. Socrates, then piety, since it is the art of attending to the gods, is a benefit to the gods and makes them better, and would you agree that when you do a holy or pious act, you are making one of the gods better? Euthyphron, no, by Zeus, not I. 
Socrates, nor do I, Euthyphroan, think that that's what you meant, far from it, but I asked what you mean by attention to the gods, just because I did not think you meant anything like that. Euthyphron, you are right, Socrates, that is not what I meant. Socrates, well, what kind of attention to the gods is holiness? Euthyphron, the kind, Socrates, that servants pay to their masters. Socrates, I understand, it is, you mean, a kind of service to the gods? Euthyphron, exactly. This actually highlights some of the other definitions of therapeia for folks who are interested in the etymology of the word. As I mentioned before, service in this case often meant either repair work, child rearing, or physicianship, all of which are meant to improve the state of the recipients. Socrates, of course, goes on to demolish both definitions of service, but that's neither here nor there. I already did a video on Euthyphro's dilemma for those who are interested in examining that further. Aristotle in politics discussed appointing of priests from the citizen class rather than farmers and the like. Priests must be appointed neither from the tillers of the soil nor from the artisans, for it is seemly that the gods should be worshipped by citizens, and since the citizen body is divided into two parts, the military class and the counselor class, and it is seemly that those who have relinquished these duties owing to age should render to the gods their due worship, and should spend their retirement in their service. It is to these that the priestly offices should be assigned. But what about theurgi, or in Greek, theurgia? Theurgia were originally the rights of a group of Chaldean priests, though the term was later used by Iamblikos to refer to all rights that he thought were legitimate involving the gods, including things like like intellectual contemplation, meditation, and rituals, often steeped in the mystery tradition of Greeks in Egypt and mixed with Neoplatonic thought. The term was also later adopted and commented on by Emperor Julian. Effectively, with his definition, it means practice or work relating to the gods rather than quote unquote working with them in a collaborative effort toward a goal. I'm not gonna get too deep into all of that here because it's its own entire belief system and I would have to explain far more than this video would allow with the time that it's already getting on to. But suffice to say, he had his own in-depth theories about the role that certain kinds of offering contemplation and mystery rites played in the elevation of the soul in the Neoplatonic worldview. Some translate theurgia as working with the divine as opposed to divine work, meaning bringing oneself into alignment with the divine as much as is possible for a partially corrupted soul, which I might argue, again, for the most part is either an Orphic or a Neoplatonic thing to believe that the soul is immediately and completely corrupted because of Titanic blood influence and other things. This isn't quite an accurate definition in any case. As I said before, it's a term that encapsulates all kinds of different rites and activities involving the gods and thereby is fairly imprecise when discussing things outside of a Neoplatonic context, as there's a whole set of beliefs tied to it that many who use it in the modern day might not have a full grasp on. This actually brings us back to the original topic for the video. Part four, the work with wars. It's fairly clear from the terminology we've examined, the majority of ancient Greeks had a very service and worship-oriented approach to Cadiz and the gods, which makes a lot of sense when you think about the way that divinity was often viewed in ancient times. These incredible beings, much larger than we are as puny humans and able to influence every aspect of our lives, even inserting thoughts into our minds or taking away our memories, terrifying when we encounter them in epiphanies, would necessitate an approach of reverence by their very nature. The terms we've looked at, although not exhaustive are fairly representative of the mindset and actions associated with maintaining relationships with the Theoe. Which brings us back to the original worship and work with debate. Many on the worship side believe that those who use the term work with are disrespecting the gods by treating them as equals or are merely giving in to religious trauma. Whereas the work with crowd often has a number of reasons they use for the phrase. I actually asked my community before starting work directly on this script and got a number of answers, though they largely fell into a few broad categories. The first category had to do with a theological distinction many of them drew between the way that they defined worship and working. Worship in these folks' minds fell primarily to prayer and only included thanks and or praise, whereas work entailed any requests that they might make of the gods that also required work on their end to fulfill, which if we're being honest is a majority of requests that people can make of the gods, as I outlined in my video on prayer. The second category of people classified things like magic as working with the gods and most other things as worship, which makes sense when you think about the occult definitions of more practices, often being called spells, or workings. The last category did have an aversion to the term worship due to trauma or other things, but in my community at least, they were surprisingly in the minority. There was some overlap between categories and folks who responded, such as many folks who also practice magic, also seeing prayer requests as being in the work category. But all in all, the assumptions made of people who use these terms often turned out to be either false or misleading when one actually talks to them. From all of the research I've done, the most accurate translation of the most common idea, which was the first one, would likely be propitiation 
creation, as the gods are being asked for their divine assistance on projects which you as a human have to complete. It's important to note that Hesiod uses the word propitiation when talking about daily offerings in a farming context, as Nestor does as well following the appearance of Athena. One could argue the majority of magic found in the Greek magical papyri would fall under the category of propitiation as well, as the theological view of many of those spells is that special knowledge of symbolism, secret names, etc. were all given to humans and passed down in secret to delight the gods, and thereby ensure that they would be kindly to, or hilaus, to whatever cause that they were being called upon to aid in. Thergy isn't my strongest suit, as I'm not a Neoplatonist, but what I see when reading through Iamblichus and commentaries on him is someone discussing ways to bring human souls closer to the gods and thereby more like them, rather than working directly with the gods somehow on a project. It encapsulates an entire belief system and set of specific rites referring to work involving the divine, and thereby isn't likely applicable outside of a very specific Neoplatonic context, and should likely be primarily used by those who fully understand the concepts that they are discussing there. That said, if folks prefer other terminology, the community at large really needs to stop shaming people for it. The fact is, English is a very different language than Greek, and there aren't hard, definitive translations for many of the terms used in ancient times. Worship fits neatly, but not perfectly, for many of them referring to praise, celebration, offering, and awe, such as Time, Sabasnos, and Samotes. And propitiation fits well enough when you're trying to assuage wrath. Apotropias mata or helaskamai, or request something of the gods, helasmos. When you start to get into purification and expiation, though, the terms get a bit muddier in English, as many would use the term propitiation for expiation, which also has a bit of a Christian slant to it. Our culture is also different in many of the colloquial beliefs about deity, personal responsibility, free will, and the role of humans in the cosmos. This means that many may feel differently about their relationship with the gods than folks did in ancient times, and ultimately that's between them and the gods, not for the community to police. I think asking questions and exploring things theologically, encouraging each other to examine critically the language that we use when describing our practices, is significantly more helpful and productive than being pedantic about terms or assuming and projecting ideas onto other people because of their usage of terms. It could simply be a difference in theological perspective, and either proposing alternative terms, or at the very least discussing and coming to an understanding rather than criticizing, ultimately will serve you significantly better in your discourse around these sorts of discussions. I do think it's important to understand how we apply these terms and why we make the choices we do so we can be conscious about them. Questioning why someone uses a particular term to understand them is a very different thing than ascribing a motivation, such as you think you're equal to the gods, which is hubris, which I've often seen lobbed at folks who will use work with to describe their relationships. While I might not be comfortable describing my relationship to the gods in that way, others may feel it fits, and exploring why is a much more positive and helpful path moving forward than trying to prescribe terms onto others. Either way, I hope that this particular entry into my catalog helps with exploring these concepts a little more thoroughly, and I'm hoping to see a discussion that gets started in the community about the terms we use and why. Precision of language can be important, as I mentioned in the introduction. As when we're trying to integrate more pagan-centric worldviews into our lives, the terms that we use can make a huge impact on exactly how we think and what we do. So ultimately, choose the words that you use when talking about your interactions with the gods with care. Maybe consider more carefully why you use the ones you do. Try talking about it in the community. I mean, heck. There's a Discord server, link is in the description for this community, which allows for those sorts of wonderful and interfaith discussions to take place. Either way, thank you so much for sticking through that. If you're new here, propitiate the algorithm with the subscribe button and purify the like with smoky sulfur. Drop down into the comments and let me know how you feel about all this. What do you think? What terms do you use for your practice? Do you feel any of the ones that I've talked about fit better than some that you had used before? I look forward to leading all of your answers, even if I don't always get so much time to reply. Special thanks also to my patrons and to Martiana, aka Sartrix, who helped me locate some of the terms that I discussed in my video. She does some amazing work and it's well worth checking out if you ever get the chance. Also, if you'd like to support content like this, check out the description for links to my Patreon, Ko-Fi, and Etsy store where I sell the common Hellenism calendar and hand-knitted things that rotate out fairly frequently. All of it helps me afford the expensive monographs and lexicons that I use for videos like this. May the cycle of reciprocity between us ever remain positive. And remember, we're stronger together.